Good morning, it's Jim and Becky behind the camera in Beaverton, Oregon, and we are the With It Retirees. Uh, <coughs> in a couple of weeks ago, I filmed a video showing how you might use mushrooms as a hobby. And when I did that, I had a, a fruiting block that I showed. You can go back and see it. And I put that block and one more like it uh, in my fruiting chamber two weeks ago. And this is what's happened. You can see it has a wonderful uh, bunch of chestnut mushrooms that are just ready to eat. And I uh, thought it would be a good time to take the first steps down the road for actually learning how to make these if you decide that's what you want to do. Uh, I should say that mushrooms are wonderful because you can take them and leave them and stop doing it. And if you, you, uh, you can do it year round and make yourself a, a sort of a stream of mushrooms. Uh, you can have some in a bottle and some in a bag and some in here all at the same time. So uh, let's, uh, let's get started. So you need a pot like so, something like that. I have two different kinds of uh, wheat berries and I have rye berries. When I, uh, if you go on the internet and look at YouTube, most people seem to think rye berries are the very best. And uh, I used rye berries for a long time and then my supply of rye berries dried up. I couldn't get them. So I then went to a wheat berry, which is the, the second best thing. And I, uh, I can't really tell any difference between the two. I think they both work fine. Uh, they look a little bit different. And by the way, the wheat berry I'm using is a gold. I haven't tried any, but I've tried this a couple times and it's worked good. And this quite a few times. So anyhow, you take one sack of this, whichever sack you want, they're, uh, these are two pound bags, and for my purposes, we're gonna go with the, my mix. So two pound bag of either one, and you put it in a pot like this, and uh, cover it in water, and then mix it up, rinse it off, and, and pour it off a couple times to clean it. This uh, comes from a health food store for it. It's ridiculously clean, so you really could almost miss that. And by the way, it's quite inexpensive, under $2 a bag. So you, uh, you put it in your pot, cover it with water, and you leave it for about seven hours at room temperature uh, and just you can mix it once in a while you just you're just letting the the wheat berry hydrate uh, so at that point then you're going to put it on the stove and you're going to heat it up to where it starts to get to a low boil a simmer just a little bit and hold it right there for about five minutes is the way I do it. Some people do it a little longer, but let's just say five minutes at a real low simmer and then take it off the stove. Set it there. Now, at that point, you're gonna get, this is uh, actually 90% shade cloth. Uh, you can use a bunch of different things, but I take a piece of this and I cover it over a bin that I have and I duct tape it on so that I have kind of a little trampoline thing going. You can also use a window screen for that, or you could use a bin at the bottom and it'll actually work, but this is better. So I have my uh, little cover here of this stuff around, and I take this and I dump it right on there. And it's still hot, remember, it's gonna be steaming. And then you're gonna take a spoon or something like this and just spread it out, and it'll sit there and steam. And it's going to start drying out as it steams. The heat will dry it out. And this is the part, it's kind of half science, half art. Uh, when you get ready, oh, actually, let me, go, let me back up and say one more thing. A lot of people use uh, gypsum in their mix. And there are various reasons people use for it. And I haven't really found one I heard that sounded good. And I didn't have any, so I didn't use it. So I never use it. So uh, you'll notice that I do this without gypsum and I have never noticed any problems. So we'll go from there. Anyhow, back to my steaming uh, wheat berries. Now they're gonna start to dry out just a little bit on the outside and that's when you want them. About a half an hour or so. You move them around a few times and uh, then you take them from here and you're gonna scoop them into wide mouth one pint canning jars. Uh, this is a particular one is a ball. They come in uh, Kerr and there's also uh, another brand. Anyhow, they all have the same lid. They all fit this 
Um, you need to have six of these to do what I'm doing. And then you get some of these. These are uh, called airport lids. They, these are store-bought, you can build them, but they're not expensive and you use them over and over again. So here we have a filter, a little pad in there, and that's a, a I don't know, this is 0.22 microns. Uh, so it allows a little bit of air through, but no uh, bad beasties, which is what you're trying to keep out. You're trying to remain sterile. And then over here, these are injection ports for a hypodermic needle, which I'll show you in a little bit. And then, of course, it's sealed here. So you fill these jars with this spoon. And at this point, you don't have to worry about being too sterile because you're going to put everything in a pressure cooker. So you scoop this out, and you fill this about three-quarters full. Not too full because you're going to want to shake it at some point. So then you put this back on there, seal it down, make sure this is good. And mind you, most of these jars I've used many, many times over in the lids too. So there we go. Now I'm going to take this piece of tin foil and we're just going to put it down like so. And that keeps, when it's in the pressure cooper, it keeps stuff from going right down into the filter. Now I want to show you the next step which is the pressure cooker. This is a Presto pressure cooker. It has a, uh, you're gonna run a 15 pound pressure. They come with these. The one it comes with is the one you want. Uh, if you dump this upside down, it'll fall on the ground, I know, because it does that for me almost every time. So there's your gauge. Let me show you what we've got inside here. This is called a trivet. This is what your bottles will sit on. This one did not got much depth to it. So I want to run this a while and not worry about it. So I put, you can go ahead and shine your light down if you can. Uh, four of these, I just spread them around and I put this on it. And that brings me up quite a ways off the ground. I'm not, anyhow, and then you set it there. Now, at that point, I put four liters of water in there. Uh, if you don't do that, it'll go dry. It calls for at least three, so I use four, uh, roughly a gallon of water. Uh, so then you, you can, I can put uh, six of these in there without any effort, right around, and I put a plate on top of them at the end. I put this on the stove, and I heat it up to where this goes to 15 pounds. And uh, you can heat, start on high and then go down to a sort of, it'll take about a medium low setting. You'll get it with your stove and it'll just stay and it'll run and you're gonna run it for two hours. Uh, it makes a little bit of noise, but I kind of like the noise. Anyhow, uh, then you're gonna take it off the burner <coughs> and uh, let it set overnight and it'll cool down on its own. It's gonna be hot for a long, long time and it's sealed. So the next morning, you come and you take these bottles out of here uh, one at a time, but be careful with them. Now you're going to go on to the uh, final step. These are all cool, and they are sterile. So everything now that you take out of here will no longer be sterile, and you have to think about that. Come over out here, and I'm going to go to this. Uh, this is the last part, almost. It's called a laminar flow hood. I, it's silly me when I first started looking at these, I thought that laminar was a guy's name and he had invented this, but not so. <laughs> laminar uh, has to do with the directional flow of molecules that don't allow stuff to come in from the outside. So what this is, is a fan that blows through a really nice HEPA filter. And the air coming out of here is sterile, and anything in this area right here is sterile. So what you want to do is, uh, Squirt this with 70% uh, isopropyl, wipe it down with paper towels. You're going to don your gloves, nitrile, and a mask, because you're the one that does most of the contaminating. You can keep these gloves wet with alcohol all the time and they will stay real good with you. So you put those on. Uh, now you're going to take this bottle that you have here. Spray it down with alcohol, wipe it off. Now as you enter here, remember you're sterile. Down there like so, throw that away. Now, 
you've done the same thing with this. What we have here is a uh, hypodermic needle with a liquid culture. In this case, it's pink oyster mushroom. I, I get these five at a time, five different ones, and you can make three bags with each one. So the reason I don't have the pink pearl in the refrigerator where I keep most of them is because it's a warm weather, and if you put a pink oyster in the refrigerator, it will die. So uh, anyhow, the way these work, this tip on here unscrews, the piece in there where you see the needle, take that out. You're going to do it in this area after everything is and then uh, is uh, sterile. You screw it right in there. And then you take that of the needle and you just stick it in that gray hole right there. It's not a hole, it's a self-sealing hole. Stick it in there and shoot about a third of this or three cc's right into the mixture. Pull it out and you're done. Now, this is no longer has to be sterile because that's a self-sealing thing. Now you have all of the uh, grain in here and you just take this and you put it in the cover. So here's the cover. Now we come out. Here we have two that we just did a couple weeks ago about the time we put those in. Uh, this one is a uh, black pearl king oyster. It's just starting to go here. Uh, this is all the rage with the commercial growers like this a lot. It's a cross between a king oyster and a uh, regular pearl oyster. Uh, I guess that is anyhow. And, and it, has, it grows a great big black oyster and mushrooms, which I haven't done yet. And this one is a regular pearl oyster, which is just a nice white uh, uh, oyster mushroom. Nice to eat. I haven't eaten it yet, but I will. So, in effect, Every time you do these, you can put a new tiny in there and try it and just keep going. So anyhow, now we have this, and that's where we're going to end it today, because the next part of this is where we're going to take this bottle, and we're going to turn it into a fruiting mushroom block, which is the block you see there the mushroom is growing out of. And then we're going to let that one do the same thing as this one, where you'll see in the next video and we'll be done and we'll grow some mushrooms. So uh, that's all I have for today. Oh, one uh, couple of notes. Two things that separate a real easy uh, production from making it hard is a pressure cooker, which is not particularly expensive. Uh, you can sterilize everything in it. If you don't have any uh, laminar flow hood, you can use great big bottles with this, use the same lid on it, and just uh, fruit out of the bottle when the time comes. Uh, but the pressure cooker is a must of some kind. They go from pretty simple to real, real spendy, but this one works just dandy. And this is a laminar flow hood. Uh, they're expensive, but if you really want to be in the business, this is something you want. You can make your own, but uh, by the time you've made it, I looked into it, uh, and you've bought the real fancy uh, HEPA filter and all the stuff and done a good job of it, 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 it will almost cost you as much. So I really recommend you to get one of these and one of those if you want to do it. Uh, anyhow, we'll see you on the next one. Uh, see you later.